Yo, welcome Fronies. So we are adding a new content series to our channel and we will from now on react to all the official content that is being released by the Throne and Liberty official channel. And we are starting with the massive news from Tico. What's up gamers? Welcome to Tico Talks Throne and Liberty. My name's Tico and I'm the globalization design manager at Amazon Games for Throne and Liberty. And I'm here to give you some updates on the game and a little peek at what's coming soon. I've been spending a ton of time in the game, having a blast with all of you, and now that we just released our Haunted Harvest Halloween update, I'm even more excited. Like that small piece of information is already really important. We are having someone that is actually playing the game. If I'm not mistaken, like a lot, like he has hundreds of hours already. Everyone has had a chance to check out the event. The limited time Haunted Labyrinth Dungeon is so fun. And I love seeing all the clever things people are doing with their outfits to get in the festive mood. Let's talk a bit about how things have been going and what we're planning in the coming months. First, I want to give a huge thank you to the millions of players that have joined us so far on this journey. We wanted to make sure that crossplay was enabled. Interesting. He says millions and millions of players. I would have really loved if they would have dropped a number or a sheet because they got the data, right? We only see CCU and Steam. We don't know console and stuff. I'm really curious of what the actual player number is. From day one, and it's been awesome to see that investment pay off. This great community has grown so quickly in this first month, and we're just getting started. Of course, any game launch of this magnitude has lots of craziness that comes with it. We've been in constant contact with NCSoft to address player feedback, and we hope you've seen some of that in the last few weeks. So let's talk more about how we're moving forward. Let's start with a topic we all hate and every MMO deals with, bots. The battle against bots is well underway, and I want to tell you a bit about what we're doing to attack bots on multiple fronts. First, we're continuing to improve our detection algorithms and are now running those daily to ban bots as quickly as possible. This here is an important factor. They're saying they're running it daily. So what other games are struggling with, especially MMOs, when they are doing ban waves, sometimes, especially if it's a free to play MMO, you cannot ban them in waves fast enough to make the bot not worth running. But you need to kill them before they're able to earn a significant amount of Lucent that they can sell on the black market. And I think just this change makes it different to other MMOs like WoW, for example, that are banning in wave. So I like that one. It's a small piece, but it's important. Second, we're attacking the areas in which bots can operate and continuing to look for ways to make it difficult for bots to do business. But we want to do that while minimizing the impact to real player experience. We have some plans related to the auction house to impose protections to limit bots' impact there. We will share more on that once we are able but can't reveal too much detail that could be used to circumvent our safeguards. Yeah, I think it's like a real balance act because if we are real, all the stuff with like lithography, straight extraction stones, all of that is into place, not for like a player experience. It's only for bot preventing to be able to farm everything unlimited. So I'm really curious what they're doing so it does not impact the players at all. I find it hilarious that I've seen many Reddit posts where people are having like minus 90,000 Lucent, minus 70k Lucent, and they're not getting banned. I think this is a hilarious idea. I've seen it in other games. I think they should actually top it up one notch and make like an exposing threat in Discord or something like this, where all of those um, cheaters are actually being exposed with their character name as well. Third, we're actively actioning players who engage in RMT behavior. Okay, now. Participating in RMT negatively impacts several Im aspects of the game including empowering bot activity, compromising the hard work of players who follow the rules, and more. We will continue to action players with more severe punishments as appropriate, including negative loosened balances, full yeah. auction house lockouts, yeah. suspensions, and bans, as we have zero tolerance for this type of behavior. The next thing I want to talk to you So what he did not address is all those people losing, using macros and auto block mechanisms in PvP. He, he was only touching the farming part. about his world bosses, which are garnering a lot of discussion in the community. So I want to take some time to discuss that. First, let's talk about loot drops. Many of you have been feeling that world bosses have often left you feeling disappointed because you don't feel there's a meaningful chance to acquire gear during these events. To improve this, we're going to do two things. First, we're going to increase the number of portals that appear for peace mode bosses. The portals will be generated based on player counts, but on average, I would expect you to see at least one more portal per boss. This should help spread players out across more fights, giving more opportunities to acquire drops. So that additional portal will mean we are getting 
more loot overall per week on the servers while i can understand that some people are like frustrated that they're never never getting a, a loot from a world boss i do not agree 100 with like making every piece of item and gear really accessible i know that in like modern gaming people always want to have everything and they want to have it now it's not as common anymore to work towards an item for like multiple months even longer and people are just not used to it anymore but i think in mmos what i liked previously a lot was like owning an item that was really rare where i put lots of effort in and i hope that they're still able to keep that somewhat balanced so it actually gives you that feeling of accomplishment if you get something that is rare. The second thing is we're introducing a new chest drop that has a chance to be included in your participation reward after the boss dies. This chest will allow you to select one of any of the epic items the boss Elect. can drop, which we hope will also give players the agency of choosing a reward that's most relevant to them. You can select it. Okay, interesting. So basically, when you're initially gearing out, like I would say, this is nice, you get what you want. And later, you can just pick whatever is giving the best loosened, right? And you just litter it to sell or, or like trade extract. I don't know, like, like feels a bit like depending on how high the chance is to get that box, similar to when we were talking about how high the chance is to get the salvation. There it was 7%. So I hope they're not doing something similar because if so many people that are participating in or those bosses are getting that at a seven percent rate i don't know what it is but if it would be like this like that would flood the market and kill the prices and don't make that loot special at all all items from this chest will be untradeable though the non-weapon items can be lithographed if the player chooses players can expect both of these changes to yeah. be live following our maintenance on october 31st We've also been paying attention to the impact that the Eclipse skill is having on peace mode bosses occurring within Abyss dungeons. Ooh. We think that this <laughs> oh. is disrupting the expected flow of gameplay for individuals attempting to participate in peace mode bosses, which are meant to be a PvP-free experience for those players. So we're making an adjustment so that when peace mode bosses spawn in dungeons, there will be an additional new portal outside the dungeon that will take players directly to the safe zone inside the dungeon. This way they can enter the peace mode boss as expected without passing through areas that may have turned into a conflict zone due to the Eclipse skill. I gotta say, even though we have been doing it as a guild, like using the Eclipse to get people off of peace bosses, especially Unibot, I think that change is really good for the community because I don't think it makes sense to force PvE players into participating in PvP. They should just be able to do what they enjoy without being forced into it. This change is expected to go live in mid-November. The Eclipse skill itself will continue to change the dungeon into conflict mode, as always. Finally, for bosses, there's been talk about how contribution works in relation to the loot drops. Later this week, we will be releasing an article that defines and describes how loot distribution works across all content types. Okay, that's interesting because you guys know it, how often we are getting the question in stream, like how does it work? Is it party contribution, guild contribution? And I've already talked about that, um, that it's not working the same as in Korea. And maybe this is going to be our solution. Once that pops up, I will definitely cover it on the channel. So don't forget to hit the subscribe button to not miss that video. But I want to briefly touch on this specifically for Conflict World bosses. With the recent change locking boss loot to the original owner for 10 minutes, some guilds have been wondering what the value of PvP is in these events. The spirit of the Conflict World boss is that guilds are fighting to control the area to allow their guild to damage the boss and raise their contribution, thus increasing their chances to get better loot. In addition to increasing your own contribution though, you can also decrease other guilds' contribution. In conflict mode, you do this by killing players from rival guilds, which will reduce that player's contribution by 70% each death. So reducing another guild's contribution increases your relative contribution. So it's a major factor in determining the loot that can drop for you. Yeah, so we already know that because that's also the reason why the when you die, and the boss is almost about to be dead. You stay in the death screen at the boss, right? Before you rest. So that, I guess, is like known that you're reducing contribution by killing other people. But um, I'm highly interested in that um, overall system because that will also allow us uh, with the guild to do all of that way more specifically. We are working on introducing some contextual UI indicators of contribution amounts. Ooh. And we hope that this will help guilds be more strategic about which opponents to focus their attacks on. Okay, so that's basically not like a dps meter this is a guild dps 
meter for a boss, basically. I think the danger with DPS meters is that it can turn toxic and people are like kicked because they don't do enough damage or whatever. But at the current state, I don't think that that will be an issue when it comes to guild versus guild because it cannot be broken down to an individual person. So I think that change is really, really nice and allows for more informed decisions while you're PvPing as a guild. So definitely a W here. And maybe they can also bring out DPS meters, of course not public, but for you individually, you can see your DPS because that makes it so much easier to optimize builds. Like always having to use an Excel spreadsheet to calculate an effective DPS, it's kind of um, a pain. Moving on from world bosses, I want to talk about co-op dungeons. We have made three recent changes to matchmaking for dungeons. To help with queue experiences, we introduced a new option to queue for a random dungeon when using party matchmaking and we made a change to better match players based on their combat power. That last change what they said, I can 100% confirm it. Yesterday we did a lot of dungeon runs on stream and I was having insanely fast groups for random. We were able to get most of the bosses down without them even doing a mechanic. So I can guarantee you that that worked. To better align group capabilities. To help with completion rates, we increased the damage and HP buff when queuing through matchmaking to be 10%, up from 5%. All of these changes went live on October 17th. Then, in order to improve the rate in which players can acquire their desired gear, we made another change following the Haunted Harvest Halloween update that provides a bonus reward when queuing for random dungeons. Each successful random dungeon completion will reward one additional dimensional soul shard and will also have a chance at a larger reward of one dimensional essence. We hope that these changes have had a meaningful impact to your experience with co-op dungeons. We're gonna keep monitoring the data, we're gonna keep listening to player feedback, and we'll continue to tweak if needed. Hey, that's interesting, because I think that change was like really good, and not only because it helps newer players to get like their purple weapons faster with the salvation and all of that, actually in regards of Q speed, because since you're having this, the queues pop up really fast, because you force everyone in. The only thing that's currently negative about it is that you can actually see what dungeon you're about to be queued in, and then you can just cancel it until you get the one. So it's defeating the random purpose. And you're getting a reward extra for being random. And you have the select chest, which means when even if you're going random, you can always just use those chests to get the tokens from the dungeons that you did not get matched to. So it is somewhat equal. I've been testing that actually with going random, not re-rolling, and it is equaling out somewhat with the chest. So I would highly prefer that they are just removing the ability to see what you is, and you're just going into a queue blind, and then you will see it once you pop up in the dungeon. I think if they're doing it like this, you will still have decent queue times. The people will still be satisfied because at the moment they're having like an imbalance of like 10 tokens here, 16 tokens here, there, and they're already freaking out and, and wanting to go for that 10 token dungeon, while overall for a longer period it will actually not matter. All right, let's talk now about some major systems that players may already be familiar with because of their time playing on the Korean service. In particular, I want to talk about two systems, Substance Transformation and the Rune System. And I want okay. to be very... So if you don't know what that is, I will pop in two videos because I already have a guide on how the rune system worked in Korea and how it worked, um, the substance transformation worked. So you get an idea because they're probably doing changes because they have said in a previous interview that without changes, they are not going to release it in global. So if you're interested to understand what the changes are, what the system is, check it out. Very clear here. Neither of these systems will launch in our service with their current functionality. We're working closely with NCSoft to make updates and both systems will be improved in a way that will satisfy both Korean and global users. While not all changes are finalized, here are some things I can say for now. For the rune system, it will have at a minimum the following adjustments. First, rune slot unlocking will no longer require RNG to obtain your desired slot type. Ooh, that's a big reduction of pay to win cause like you could go and buy those rune hammers in your auction house and then you would have to gamble it attack runes only had a 10 percent chance to actually be unlocked and you needed at least one of those slots to get your synergy effect so that is a big w for free to play players second we're introducing a separate rune bag with improved searching capabilities to reduce the burden on your traditional inventory and storage insane quality of life feature like in korea Inventory management felt like I'm getting overloaded with runes. I don't know what the fuck to do. It's everything is full. And having a separate bag is perfect. Really nice. Loving it. While also making it easier to find your desired runes. For substance transformation, 
It will at a minimum be changed so that tradable items cannot be used in the system. But again, W, they have removed the pay to win from it 100%. Like, like the biggest critique on the system was you can just go to the auction house, buy whatever you want and just keep rolling, rolling, rolling until you get your items. Like you could even get the band of Universal there, completely defeating the purpose that that ring is dropping at Queen Belandir. Now they're making it so you cannot just go in the auction house on a shopping spree and get it at day one. That is nice again w especially for free to play players this means you cannot infinitely buy items from the auction house to feed the system to earn rewards since the amount of items that can be fed may be decreased because of this we're evaluating the requirements of how much has to be fed into the system to gain rewards although we don't have any specific changes related to trait resonance at this time i'm sure we're going to find out some nice farming techniques that give you like the most um, farm crowd for substance transformation points um, to gamble that a lot Time. This system is not planned to release in the near future, and we are still actively discussing any potential adjustments for this system with NCSoft prior to its release. While we're on the topic of upcoming systems, I want to talk about a them not releasing it in the near future is a bit of a bummer. I expected it to be released more soon because our Expo Dagger build is lacking a bit of health in the current setup, which we would have easily been able to obtain with the rune system and trade resonance. I will see how that monitors out. Maybe we are also changing um, to items. Growing desire from our players to have the ability to engage in more structured PvP outside of the competitive large-scale options currently available in the open world events and conquest battles. I'm happy to say this is something we've had on our radar for a while, and we're excited to bring you a new feature that will come in mid-November that will provide on-demand battle feature. I don't want to reveal the demand battle feature. So they didn't say how many, how versus how many, or if it's like guild versus guild, and you can just bring if you have if you are full with 70, you can bring them, which I think is like unfair. It would be better if it's like equal numbers all the time. And I'm also curious, because in the Korean post regarding the roadmap. They mentioned that that will be competitive and it will have a ranking system like Arena. So if that is true, that can be like the way for guilds to show off. Because Castle Siege, I would say, is not the way to show off as a guild. There's a lot of politics. There's a lot of alliances, betrays going on. This is not a skill matchup. And I think if that is getting a ranked system, that will be the ones that measures if a guild is good or not. Too much yet, but this will allow players to engage in non-competitive PvP across arenas and conquest battles, with varying numbers of teams and team sizes, both in public and private matches. So stay tuned for more updates about that in the coming weeks. There's been so much great feedback from everyone in the oh, community. I don't know why. I know he didn't mend it, but when he said public matches, I was instantly thinking, are they preparing to have esports? I don't know why, why that just came up in my mind. But that mode is also perfect for tournament hosting for everything. You know what I mean? I don't know, getting like a 40 versus 40, uh, that's castable. Like, like that's that's tournament stuff. Let's see if we're getting it. Like, if Crony Liberty turns into an esport title, I would fucking love it. That would be insane both positive comments and suggestions for how to improve the game. Thank you. We're really grateful that you are all this invested in helping us continue to improve the game. We're just getting started, and this week on October 31st, our first player survey will open. You will be able to access it from the Silesium Notice Board in-game, and I want to really encourage you to take it. We take the results very seriously, and real actions have spawned from all of our previous surveys. We are always listening to your feedback, whether it's through the surveys, reading your reviews on the major gaming platforms, or comments in Discord and social media. We're always using your voice to help guide our development and using it to improve the overall Throne and Liberty experience. So please keep the feedback coming. That last statement there, I have heard so many developers say, but almost no one do. And based on that thing, like everything in that video is a W, they have addressed so many issues that the community had, and they've actually done it in a in a time frame, which I would say is like acceptable for a developing and like for changes to be pushed. Of course, you will you already have some people that quit because they were unsatisfied, but it's still in a time frame where the majority of the player base will actually get to see the changes being made. Like I don't know, I don't want to lick their ass too much, but I would say that is a big big W video. It's a ten out of ten for me. All right, that brings us to the community question. What we'd really like to know is, what would you like to see changed in Throne and Liberty? Leave your thoughts down below in the comments. As you said, 
Leave your thoughts down in the comments. If we get a meaningful collection of ideas, I will put it into a document and forward it to Amazon. And as always, guys, if you have any questions, just also drop them in the comments. I will try to answer everything in less than 24 hours. Cheers, guys. Thank you.